Thank you very much. Um, gloomy autumnal night indeed. I come from Newcastle. This is um, this is summer holidays. Um, it's so nice to be here and incredibly nice to be um, actually with the work. So often when you do these talks, you have projected PowerPoints and a great distance from the wonderful things themselves. So that feels a real luxury. Um, I'm sure that during the course of our conversation, we will um, point out a few works that are specifically in the, the exhibition, but certainly to start off with, I wanted to talk about some more general preoccupations and uh, maybe do a bit of amateur psychology to really get to grips right. with what's uh, behind these works. Um, Ange and I met up uh, to have a little conversation about what this talk would entail um, a few weeks ago. And as these things do, it took uh, a little while to arrange with some emails going back and forth. Um, but each time we were in touch and said that she was um, engrossed in a new period of research to start the next body of work. Um, and some research that was seemed far and away beyond the studio. And I started to get this kind of image of you in my head as this intrepid explorer with a, a notebook and a magnifying glass and a, a little bag with sandwiches going off into the world, into museums, archives, um, into many different contexts to, to get a, a new subject and to amass a wealth of thoughts and materials. So I'm curious to start off with by asking you a bit more about that research, where you go, what do you do, what do you, how do you gather your thoughts to start making a new body of work? Well, it's actually quite a hard process to describe, <laughs> but I tend to try and see everything that interests me, and then at that point I'll, something will spark and I'll feel really excited about carrying the work in a new dimension, in a new direction. Um, because one of the things that I'm really keen to do with my work always is I'm, I don't want to plateau or to continue with the work that I'm making. I always want to try and push it somehow. I think that's really important to you so it keeps its energy and its vivacity and, and it, so it keeps, so it sparkles for me while I'm making it. And it's, um, so it's, it's about that really and I do see lots of different things and I read lots of different books and... Um, I'm never entirely sure where inspiration will strike. It might be at a gig, or it might be reading a book of poetry, or it might be um, going to see the Indian exhibition at the V&A, for example. Um, lots of different things combine. And then there's a sort of percolation while I'm priming and making my canvases in the studio and I'm thinking about all these things. And then I just launch out into the next series. <laughs> And there we go. Um, I mean, I really want to pick up that um, you said you read some books, and I, I think that's something of a, an understatement for me, and certainly through our conversations, um, what is incredibly clear, and of course looking at your work, is that this literary sensibility is deeply ingrained, and you are a real consumer of words. Um, is that a correct observation? I do love to read. Um, I think that probably comes from, I grew up in a household where we didn't really have television or that many books or just the general paraphernalia of pop culture. Um, and I used to just, we used to entertain ourselves. I'm one of five girls. We used to just entertain ourselves with making up different narratives and stories and playing as kids do. I think that was probably the germ of my interest in narrative. And then, of course, I did discover the world of literature. And I saw that was finally my escape from this rather boring upbringing that I was having. At that point, I didn't really know anything about painting. So that literature was probably my first love. And it does inform the work because it's quite it's quite a useful way into talking about painting sometimes. Some of the literary devices make a great useful parallel when I'm trying to articulate things that are really hard to articulate verbally in painting. Um, for example, sometimes I use the analogy of um, the way that Nabokov's Pale Fire is set out <clears throat> using a different genre um, at different places in the book. And then the actual narrative that the reader of the book puts the whole thing together in their mind, and that is the book. Um, 
Or the other example that I think I might have spoken to you about was My Name is Red by Orhan Pamuk, where a different voice of death narrates the chapter, and the colour red narrates the chapter, and people masquerading as other people narrate different um, parts of the story. And that, again, is another useful way of accessing how narrative works in my work, because there isn't a, lit a literal singular narrative, but there's fragments that exist on top of each other, or at least that's how I see it. So it's useful. Well, I absolutely wanted to also discuss that as kind of literary structure, and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. But just staying on language for a moment in terms of um, a, a mode of creation, you're I mean, you're obviously someone who revels in the joy of paint and of making, um, but these are also deeply conceptually charged works. And I know from our conversations and various bits of reading that, um, that words and text and note making and that kind of textual planning are instrumental to um, almost forming a path before you get to the visual. So you're using words to come up with a solution for the conceptual problem that will be in the painted image. Yes, that's interesting actually. I don't tend to make sketches. I do tend to write before I make, start making a painting. So exactly, that's spot on. But also, I'm really fascinated by how words work, how the mechanics of language work. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's this sort of evolution. So, currency, words fall out of currency, out of usage. And the same is true of visual languages as well. So, a really dorky example is um, one of my favorite leather jackets has got a lining in front. And the lining is um, the anarchist symbol. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I bought this jacket in a boutique in Notting Hill. I mean, it was as far away from anarchy as you could possibly be. But somehow, this anarchist symbol was um, a, a lazy cultural shorthand for just something that would be appropriate to go with a biker jacket. Sure. So I'm quite interested in how visual, visual language or language, the written word, how there's this constant evolution of things falling out of currency and how those things can be reconfigured and how there are traces and ghosts left of original meaning. Um, and I think the reason that one of the things that has come from that interest in this series of paintings is um, there's a sort of philosophical dimension to that. So Noam Chomsky said, um, language is the core property that defines us as humans. And if that core property is something that is in a, a constant state of instability and flux, then for me, I see that in relation to certain anxieties that the work explores in terms of existence and trying to quantify phenomena and trying to understand the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's an, an example of how my fascination with language is actually fed into some of these paintings. I found that absolutely fascinating because everything that you've said about <clears throat> language and its fallibilities and its slipperiness and its... Um, inadequacies are absolutely now prevalent in painting and we're in a, a state where that kind of lazy lexicon um, and that's probably not the right route but you know there's such an astonishingly loaded history that you're dealing with the old adage that every time you sit in front of a blank canvas you're seeing every single image that's ever been painted um, so how for you is painting a more why is the paintbrush mightier than the <laughs> pen and the sword? Well, of course, you can't make painting now in 2015 without understanding the context of art history. Um, and I'm very cognizant of using any references really res in a really responsible way accordingly. But somehow now painting feels as though we're, we don't have to follow some kind of avant-garde prescriptivism. We are free to mine the history of images in whichever way we want, as long as we contextualize the, the usage. And it feels, it, well, I suppose it's not different to literature in that sense, but with painting, there is room to be much more ambiguous. For me, anyway, maybe it's just my command of English isn't that good, I don't know. It is, um, I mean, it's unresolved in both cases, yeah, image making and, and, and the textual stuff, but, um, 
No, I think that, that integration of the two is, um, is a really defining thing in your work. And I also think it's very important um, structurally. And again, I might be going on the wrong path here, but if I uh, look at uh, the painting just behind the tallest tripod, um, as an example, um, Dracaena, I believe. Um, for me, I can't help but think, maybe it's my own preoccupations at the moment, or through talking to you, or just through seeing the work and how I read it, about structures of the short story. And there are these conflicting forces. I mean, here, this kind of very somber, um, I mean, almost menstrual red, but I know you'll have um, a lot more symbolism to bring that, that sets the tone, a kind of emotional uh, pitch. And then there's something of a portrait. There's this um, very sort of aggressive punk hairdo. There are all these sort of punctures of different details or narratives, the cigarette, the badges, the bandage. Um, there's an atmosphere, there's a central narrative, and there are lots of conflicting things. And to me, that has a sort of slipperiness or a fluidity of, of, um, of many short stories and a lot of the text that you've certainly referenced. Short stories as opposed to novels? Yeah, I think so. Through that sort of fragmentation oh, and yeah. state of um, unresolve. Well, yeah, it's a very pertinent example. I mean, there are, in a painting like that painting, there's lots of different kinds of language going on. So you'll have the, the pseudo exactitude of every tiny hair on her arm or his arm being painted. And while I was paint, when I use detail in that sense, sometimes it's about exploding the very business of painting. Just it is so. Um, I, I'm, it's almost so figurative that it becomes abstract because you are never, you're never at all um, confused that you're looking at anything else but a representation. So there's, there's painting that's like that, and then you're right, then there's the colour bank of behind the figure, and then there's quite thick painting which is on her hair, the stubble on her hair, and there's the very sheer painting of the, of the blouse, of the cape, sorry. Um, and the vibrant colour of the flower. And what I'm trying to do by employing those different kinds of language is to employ different kinds of readability in different zones of the painting. So in a sense, like a short story where you're sort of pulled and pushed and your expectations are confounded in, in the good short stories. I suppose that that's a direct analogy to playing with um, the readability of different different types of painting language on one plane of a painting. Do you think we still know um, how to read painting? Well... By that I mean... Yeah, go on. Traditions have changed and... Yeah, thankfully. <laughs> um, one could easily think that there was a... a not easily think, but lulled into a sensibility that there was a recognisable iconography in your work <clears throat> and the skull mortality, but not anymore. Um, we've lost that specificity, yeah. which, as you just said, is a really good thing. I mean, it's you know, an archetypal postmodern condition. Um, but I wonder, given the baggage of art history mm. and our sort of natural tendency to do that, whether that's uh, an issue or if it's something you're tapping into or enjoying or how you kind of control, think about us feeling those facts. Yes, well, interesting example, the skull. Um, you're right, if you're looking at a Dutch golden age painting, still life, if there was a skull loitering in that setup, then you would absolutely realise as one of the men that was viewing that at the time that it was about mortality or probably an extra pile of coins, and it was about mercantile wealth versus aristocratic wealth or something like that. It was quite, there was a code, and you read it, and that was that. And I used to say, actually, that um, people talking about the skull in painting, that it was more likely to be Alexander McQueen now, 
what it signifies to us, but there's so much patter out. <laughs> but actually, I don't think it even signifies that. I think it just, the skull has become almost a symbol of life because it's just this shorthand, edgy way of trying to connote cool. And with my painting, what I find interesting is, yeah, you're right, we don't talk in symbols anymore. We don't read language like that anymore in paintings, visual language like that. Um, but there's still this lingering ghost around, often with these kind of um, signifiers. We, there's often a suggestion, you might, you might think of a skull, you might see a skull in a painting, and you, there might just be a sense, a trace of what originally was intended. And I think that's what's really fascinating about painting now, is understanding the idea that there are these ghosts lingering and navigating contemporary painting now through the litter of those ghosts. And sometimes um, these things can be mutated to acquire new meanings. And that is really fascinating, I think. Is that what feeds into this uh, preoccupation with the liminal or liminal states that you have? I mean, looking around, um, in my first response to this room was trying to find, I guess, the emotional I mean, we're confronted by the figure, and I think it's a very, for me, a, a sort of logical progression to identify an emotional state of the figure I'm presented with. But here, you can't do that. These are neither happy nor sad, nor open or closed. It's not night or day. They're not, there's sort of no life or death. It's absolute, um, really unspecific, to use that word yet again. Um, all of those instabilities had to meet. Yeah, it's quite a marshy show in that sense, deliberately so. I titled this exhibition um, from the poem, the phrase uh, Foster on the Palms comes from Fabio Florida, which is the Wallace Stevens poem uh, that he wrote in 23. And the reason that I chose that poem, and liminality is part of this point, I promise. Um, <laughs> The reason that I chose that poem is because one of the central images is of um, the seascape, but the person just walking along this beach in Florida it experiences the sky and, and the sea and the shoreline as one complex phenomena. And there's no artificial attempt in the poem to try and separate out these different thresholds and these different elements. And the whole thing was just embraced in its complexity, and there was a real staggering beauty in that, actually. And I'm just going to say one more thing about the poem while I'm, while I'm thinking about it, which isn't that connected to liminality. <laughs> but um, with, that, with that portrait of something so liminal in mind, the poem goes on, and there's just this scum that's washed up. The next image is of this scum that's washed up on the shoreline. And when I was reading this poem, I was thinking, oh, well, you know, there's no dreary, romantic rainbow in the sky, or there's no sunlight filtering on the waves. It's quite a bleak poem. There didn't seem much of a, a prospect of transcendence of any kind. And then I realized that actually there was this oil slick that was in the, the chemical smear as implied in the poem. And I thought, well, actually, there is, there is a transcendent note. It's just, it's slightly debased rainbow. It's just, you know, petrol. <laughs> but it is there. And, and perhaps that we need to look at the uh, complex phenomena in, in its entirety, and perhaps we need to look at things that are overlooked in the detritus of life to find those moments of transcendence. So at that point, when I was reading the poem, I realized that I had the title for the show, because there's lots of different things and interests that feed into these works, like archaeology and language and fashion and contemporary culture, and all the history of painting, the death of painting, all of these things, more. But the one thing that underpins them all is there is this appreciation of, well, it's a rejection of neat and easy labels. And I suppose an inquiry into the nature of things as they truly are, which I don't see as these pat certainties and these easy little conclusions. You've come up with this term museum painting, which I think is fascinating and I'm sure very relevant to all of those things. I assume you could say a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, actually, the painting behind us is one of the museum paintings. And I suppose I was approaching 
few paintings that this applies to. Actually, the, the leaf over there as well, the relic, that's one of them. Um, and there's one in the other room. I suppose I was approaching them with the idea that perhaps we were dealing with a post-apocalyptic world and that this is a portrait of a tree, but it's almost like the memory of a tree. There's been, the implication is, in my approach, that it's been so long since anyone saw a tree that this is just the, the memory and approximation of what a real tree was like. And I, I sort of connect that with a shift happening in the order of things. So that's just to explain a connected thought, and now I'll, I'll address the museum thing specifically. So when I go to a museum, which obviously do a lot, um, my main point of going to a museum is to try and really understand more about myself, I think. So it doesn't matter if I'm looking at a 500 million year old fossil and trying to work out how it moved and how it lived um, and how, the, how that animal actually existed. Or if I'm looking at um, a Philip Tracy hat that's a, ja a Chinese garden and it's made out of cork with each tiny little stalk <coughs> of leaf perfectly carved out of cork. I'm really trying to understand, I think, my own existence through the experience of other people. And it's quite an alienating experience because actually what I think museums really display is, are the limits of knowledge. And I think it was Neil McGregor that was saying, you know, from the British Museum, that you have to take a real leap in your imagination to, to truly understand and approximate in your mind how what you're looking at in a museum, how it really functioned or what it really is or was. And for me, that's sort of a bit unsatisfactory <laughs> because it just confirms to me how isolated we are as individuals because I don't understand how a hat can, I don't understand how somebody could make that hat. I don't understand how one of those curled up fossils really moved along the face of the earth. And that to me, rather than expanding my knowledge, it just confers the limits of my understanding. So I think it's quite an alienating experience sometimes. That's a really wonderful metaphor for a lot of your work, which <laughs> are, I mean, this really feels like a, a literal archaeological experiment, a peeling back of the world to reveal something. And there's another work, um, I think, in the other room, of this figure riding a, a rock form. Oh, yeah. Um, and that integration is, is fascinating. But I wanted to pick up on what you just said about this kind of leap of faith and um, uh, this division between a reality and an imagined space. And um, the work that I really wanted to talk about uh, has moved. I'm sure it's moved rather than me forgetting where it is. But there's a sense in your work, um, I think there's often something unbelievable. You present, um, there's a sort of quality that can evolve into something of a cabinet of curiosities. And there are elements from the animal world and the plant world that one instantly thinks are imagined. They sort of nudge towards the surreal, but nothing in your work that's very important to state is imagined. Everything exists. Quite right. I'm glad you clarified that because we, people do love to rush to the surrealist label. You know, people love a label even if it's completely misapplied. Um, yes, exactly. Any plant form. So, for example, painting at the, on the end of this wall, you could the Matane necklace. Oh, right, okay, it's back. Back, thanks. Um, that, that features some orchids and they, they look really like monkeys. I mean, comically so, and they do grow like that. Apparently, in this country, in the southeast, but I've never seen them. Yes, they do that, absolutely. There's nothing surreal about that. Um, the blend of fact and fiction is an interesting one. I've been very uh, inspired. While I've been reading, while I've been researching this show, I was reading Fictions by Borges. I think you've read that recently mm -hmm. as yeah. well. And I love the way he blends real schools of thought and real public people with equally compelling characters that just send you off in the wrong direction because they're completely imagined. Um, so I, I suppose that's been a big influence on my work. And actually, it's quite interesting talking about that uh, set of short stories because he kind of kicks your legs from under you, doesn't he? I mean, he does that 
essay he wrote, A History of Eternity or something, even the title, it just, it just pulls you forwards and backwards through time and any kind of sense of certainty with which you think, right, okay, I'm coming to grips with the story, I know what's going on. It's always there was a problem, there's a mistake in the encyclopedia or the ma there's a maze within another maze. And I think what's really interesting about Borges' work is that after he's taken, he's removed any kind of certainty from structures that you might have about what's going on in the story, then you're free to address his metaphysical ideas, you know, about what's out there and what's the nature of things, because you're not, you're free, you're, you're freed of any literal um, plot line or, or narrative, and you can address these more abstract concerns. And I think that's something I find very inspirational. I think that's exactly what we do. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, that sort of pushing and pulling back and forth in, in time and history and that journey where you're trying to cling onto something, but then it's undermined. Um, yeah. Um, we've spoken a little bit about art history and um, its existence as a kind of burden but a force for you to bounce off and rift around um, and absolutely we now have moved away from these firm and rigid hierarchies of, of subject matter and um, like a sort of clear distinction between genre and everything's assimilating but um, looking around I don't think we could move past this body of work without um, at least discussing some element of preoccupation with portraiture and um, this figure that we are presented with in um, maybe 60% of the works in this room. It may or may not be the same figure, um, but it's an important motif. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about this person. Okay. Well, I suppose the first thing to say is that the figure is present in some of the works where there isn't a literal figure. So I see this painting behind us very much a portrait, just perhaps of a portrait of somebody that's left the scene. So it's the person who's constructed this apparatus somehow, this new tree, is very present in the work, but just as a trace. Um, and with a, with a portrait that's a more literal portrait in that sense, there, there's a lot of layers. So there's an element of autobiography, not necessarily literal, but maybe a state of mind or an idea about obsession or neurosis or something, a psychology. Then there's a layer that we might get onto later because this person has been quite influential in inspiring this exhibition, but a friend of mine that had a sex change, which is why a lot of the figures are androgynous. And a third layer in, in my approach to making these portraits is Actually, the figure is just relegated as the furniture of the painting, and it's not a character in that sense. It's just almost like a literary device. It's a device which I can hang my exploration of my ideas, my ideas about um, society and the nature of existence, and all of those kind of preoccupations. It's a way of exploring those as just using the figure as a device. So I see them as very much layered up. But still, you're using an emblem that people feel very comfortable with in the sort of figurative tradition in painting, especially. Yeah. Um, and there's an element of self-portraiture, you feel. <laughs> I've just realized that this is, you know, on the record. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, there is, but not in a, not in a literal sense. I mean, sometimes I use my own face and my own body because feel really uncomfortable having people in the studio with me and I don't, I can't really work like that. So I use that out of a, a practicality. But no, there, there are definitely elements. This very personal show, I think, this show is perhaps one of the most personal shows that I have made to date. I mean, this issue of, um, we've been talking about language as something that doesn't really function successfully to deal with its basic need mm. and images to do. I think there's, it's fascinating that you've chosen both of those devices to talk about gender and some really fundamental issues around gender that are still amazingly and shockingly 
still very difficult to talk about in today's society. Yeah. Um, so there are lots of kind of burdens there. Um, given the history of, of painting and art, I wonder what kind of burden um, the legacy of feminism is to you, both kind of critically, theoretically, writing in the 70s, but um, I mean also, I guess especially to this audience, certainly to me, through this plethora of revisionist um, curatorial endeavours, bringing together feminist projects in massive survey shows that have um, certainly swept through internationally of late. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I'm a feminist, and I've been a feminist since you know, my father explained to me and my four sisters what the situation was <laughs> as a small child, um, and that, that won't change. But I do feel some frustration with the second wave um, moment of feminism, not all of it, of course. I mean, we owe, we owe those women everything, but um, there's a sort of certain binary discussion that happens when things are male or female, and female experience is, you know, equated with male experience, and I feel that um, it's really limited, and we need to, there's more than one way to be a woman. For example, there's this whole furore about um, you know, transphobia and comments that have been made, and I just think that's an absolute scandal. Um, of course, a trans woman is a woman, and we need to broaden um, the terms of this debate hugely, I think. And it is starting to happen. There was all that amazing writing that came out in the 1990s um, with people like Rebecca Walker and Judith Butler. I mean, loads of, loads of progress has been made, but somehow it doesn't always feel reflected in your museum survey shows, for example. And I started to talk about the figure that is present in a lot of the works, and that was someone that was clo that's close to me, somebody that I grew up with, who had a sex change. And for a while, they had to, they'd had um, a double mastectomy and they hadn't yet had a penis grafted. So they, for years, were living without the markers of the gender that they wanted to be, or that they were, actually. Um, and that also brought it home. It stopped being something that was theoretical and it, seeing the pain and the, the suffering that that person was going through at close quarters over many years made me realize as well, well, what about if we think about being post-gender, what's beyond gender? Because this person was still very much the person that we all have known and loved since we were kids. So it made me wonder whether actually the ambiguity of gender is almost as though it opens out again into another metaphor, and that's some, for something that, despite everything, there's an essential remainder. And I find that that was something that was worth exploring. But that's something that's almost at the end of the exploration of gender in the work. An essential remainder. Yes, yeah, something that if you if you kick away all the all the structures that we have, which we hang our identities on, something as fundamental as gender, even if you get rid of something like that, um, there, is there something that still is there something still there? And what is the nature of that if there is something still there? So that's something that I think is very interesting. Oh, I absolutely agree, and you can feel that confrontation in your work, but you can also often get this sense of, of something veiled, which I guess is a condition that comes from that situation. Um, the first work in the room, I yeah. think, is extraordinary in that respect. You have, you know, it's a, an image of, of posturing. There's a very confident, at first, aggressive, upright pose, staring at you, sunglasses, kind of vanity and ego. And that's a presence, that's a kind of rock star, that's a punky attitude. <clears throat> but then you look closely and there's this creature wrapped around in a protective way, um, hiding, but with a very upright tail. Um, and then the sunglasses are actually just shattered. Yeah. And that feels like a, a veil to the psyche and there are there are literal veils in so many of these works. Um, so yeah, I'm curious about that idea of, of masking or presenting something, but also taking it away. That, that seems to happen so often. Well, it hopefully it's working because it's made you sort of think about what is readable and what isn't readable in the work. And that's the point, that's the function of those masking devices. Because, you know, something like sunglasses, they're a really complex cultural signifier because they're really cool, but, you know, I put sunglasses on if I'm looking a bit shit as well. Mm. They're sort of protection, aren't they? Sure. So there's always a sort of 
double edge to everything in the work, and deliberately so, so that my hope is to draw someone in. Um, I, I read as a student that the average person spends three seconds looking at a work, particularly a painting. So I, I wanted to make the language of the painting so seductive by using familiar signifiers like a portrait or using luminosity of colour so that it drags someone in by the scruff of the neck and forces them to spend a bit longer and, and makes the space much more complete, contemplative. contemplative. No, Almost there, not quite, but I'll move on. Um, so that's that's a device that I'm using to try and draw the viewer in so they spend longer thinking about these things. So hopefully long enough to try and think about the ideas behind the work, the conceptual ideas behind the work. Three seconds at each work. I wonder how many seconds a day at themselves, <laughs> which seems so relevant there. Um, hmm. There were two other questions that I wanted, well, several, many, but two from, from those things. Um, uh, I'm always really curious when an artist is thinking so much um, or thinks in any detail about the audience and, and how things are going to be read and what signs and symbols they can yeah. they can put in and, and construct. So, um, what, where's the question that's going to evolve out of that statement? I guess I'm interested in the, your process of painting and um, what journey you go on when you start with an image and mm. then you start thinking about how people are going to view it but also how you make a body of work if it's a sequential thing or if you are moving from one canvas to the other i would love to work on one painting at a time <laughs> but i have a bit of a richard dadness about me so i think it, i would probably take 10 years um, to make a painting so actually i do work in series just for practical reasons. The work takes so long to finally execute them. Some of the works in this show, this painting, for example, has taken two and a half years. And I work solidly every day, or eight hours, um, or more, at least eight hours. So I do work in series. And in terms of your initial idea about how the works evolve in terms of each painting, the idea behind the work doesn't really change. Normally, I'm fairly certain about what I want to try to articulate before I start in terms of an idea. But the actual process of painting, sometimes the articulation of that idea can change just because paint has its own autonomy or I get really carried away in one direction that's really unexpected and decide to keep it. Um, of course, the glory of oil paint is that it doesn't really dry. So for someone that dithers like me, and it can, it's the perfect vehicle. Um, and of course, you know, sometimes I have, sometimes the idea hasn't worked to my satisfaction, in which case I just sand the whole thing off or I paint over it. So some of these paintings are paintings underneath. Can you still see them when no. you look at it? That's, I don't think so. You tell me. <laughs> no, I mean in your, in your no, mind, no, not us as the viewer. No, I quite like using a canvas like that, though. It feels as though it's got a, a history to it. But I mean, as well as all these very, fundamentally conceptually driven and actually you know incredibly significant today I think this is today's zeitgeist surrounding us there's so much of the human condition there's fragility fallibility an enormous tension around identity as well as those things there is just a pure love and revelry in paint yeah. and you can see your enjoyment incredibly but Again, there's a tension between um, devices that crop up. And in many cases, we can't, as an audience, believe that it's still paint. I mean, if we go back to the rock star in the corner, um, the creature around the neck. The burbeck. You want to stroke. I mean, it's fur. There are skulls that you think are ceramic and embedded. I mean, it's an incredible skill, quite clearly, but... Um, there's still some trickery there. I'm not really that bothered about skill or technique. That, for me, is not important. Um, what is important in terms of painting now is something to do with its heritage. So I think, possibly uniquely, the heritage of painting for the last 150 years has been bound up in this idea that painting itself is dead. 
and is not um, got any currency now, and it's an anachronism. And of course it is, because I could have taken a, a photograph of a friend of mine in this pose in three seconds on my phone, you know. So what's the point of making these tiny skulls or each, each hair on the monkey? And I suppose the point is in its very uselessness, that there is no survival value in painting. We could definitely do without it. But it's one of those things that gives survival value. And there seems something quite existentially cheering, sorry to use that word, but um, because it's such a cliche. But there's something very comforting philosophically about the fact that painting still hypnotizes and seduces and has a power, something that is indefinable that we can't put our finger on, um, even now after its supposed death, there's something rather metaphorically wonderful about that, about using a media medium that has that whole premise about it before you've even started. Do you want to reclaim it? Well, I mean, I'm clearly the child that played with its own poo, aren't I? You know, I just, I think this is amazing. <laughs> you told me a really fantastic story that you may or may not be willing to share, but... Um, this is concerning. <laughs> Um, well, it evolved from this um, astonishing thing in a number of your works, and there's a very good example there, um, the, the smallest canvas, of just this, this sort of collapse or retention of paint at the bottom, bottom which is a, an archaeological, I mean, conceptually it feels like an archaeological thing, it's a human thing, it's a historical thing, but it's also a very media-specific thing, and the paint just going on the bottom. Yeah, it's completely unnecessary, completely gratuitous activity, and it rev the work revels in that. The pointlessness of painting is the point of painting. And that bit in pasto or, or the tiny detail that is completely pointless, that is exactly, that's what you luxuriate in conceptually as the, as the medium. And this idea of just hanging on immediately to every single last brush stroke and keeping it like that. Exactly. We're not going to tell the story. <laughs> um, maybe we should open it up to some questions. Yeah. It's, it, oh, <laughs> this idea that it's pointless. Um, I just, um, you know, you, you said you could take a photograph of your friend on your phone and it's done with and it's over. I mean, it gives us enormous pleasure, so it's not pointless in that sense. But I'm just wondering, you know, thinking of um, ancient people mm. and cave paintings and so on, whether for them there was that kind of deep meaning, uh, deep, deep um, use of, of, um, of painting, of marking anyway, to tell stories that... Uh, just feels that that's what you're doing as well. You're, you're showing us truths beyond, beneath the surface, that when you come and see these paintings, you see it. So, you know, it's deeply meaningful in that way. And, and, and not, I understand that all art is useless, and that's why it's great. And it's not exactly what I said. No, no, yeah. but you, do you know what I mean? The, the uselessness of it is its, is its beauty and its strength, isn't it? Because it, it takes us somewhere else, mm, yeah, away sure. from political discourse and, you know, so, so uh, I don't know if I've got a question. It's just, uh, well, I wondered if you, if you did feel, feel that cave paintings had that kind of bareness and showing, showing a deeper truth to... Sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, I suppose I'd have to take the leap that I was talking about earlier. Um, but there is something really primal about making something out of nothing. So I, I suppose in that regard, I totally understand what you're saying. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. I think as an extension of that, the thing that I find, or one of the many things I find so powerful in your work is not only your um, questioning and probing and <coughs> extension of this incredibly rich history of image making from cave painting to the present day, but um, the recontextualization of how we see images. I mean, how we see images now is you know, mediated at every turn. The internet, newspapers, this absolute clash. Literature 
everything comes together in one and there's a absolute sophistication in your work of, of how we do that and the instability of image making, images themselves, but also a sort of textual feeder and response to them, which probably wasn't around so much in, in the old cave. Any other questions? Okay. Um, there might be a mic that we need to, mic. we can project. Um, I just, I was fascinated by your, this thing you said at the beginning that, you know, before you paint, you take a pen and you write it down. And I, this is just curiosity, but what form does that text take? Is it something very descriptive of the, how you're going to lay out the painting or is it a poem? And would you ever consider showing it alongside or would it bring anything? Um, well, I write really bad poetry, which will never see the light of day. <laughs> but that's not... Um, the notes I was talking about take the form of very messy writing, and I've got probably about 30 different notebooks, quite thick notebooks, that are they accompany each painting. So it's more of a way of incredibly forgetful. So it's more of a way of just reminding myself exactly the territory that I want to try and cover. And sometimes that might be um, something as simple as, as a type of colour, or it might be to do with the conceptual idea, the premise for the painting, but it will be all in a, a sort of personal shorthand that I've developed over the years so that I can quickly write something down before the process of painting takes over and then I completely forget you know, what I've started with. So. Do you ever go back to those notes? Yes, I do, and I always just think, what the hell was that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> At least it got you somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is there's none of your writings in it, but there is a, a really fantastic book room, a reading room oh, yeah. uh, next door, which has a lot of uh, your books and um, food for thought that have been especially important to you, both like in this body of work and historically. So do go and have a look. Any other questions? Right in the back. Um, uh, t two questions. So one is, I'm just wondering at what point or if you use direct observation during the painting process and how important that is. And also I'm interested in how you choose the colors for each painting or how that happens or how you mix or, you know, how long does that take, you know, things like that, because I think the colors are so beautiful. Oh, thank so you. beautiful. Thanks. What's the first question? Um, direct observation. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't tend to use direct observation very much. Sometimes I do, but it's more the idea of something that I'm trying to represent. So I'm not trying to make it accurate. Um, and I quite like the awkwardness that comes from that process of just trying to imagine actually what a face looks like <laughs> without having somebody sitting there. I'm, I'm not a portrait painter in that sense. I'm not bothered about um, anatomical correctness. Um, so in that sense, no. I don't draw from life because it's not important. And the second question in terms of choosing the palette tends to be, it tends to be linked in very much with the idea. It tends to be quite immediate. Sometimes though, I might have painted a dusk scene. This happened fairly recently, not with this show. I painted a, a scene, a landscape, um, or a still life. The genres are kind of collapsed in the work, but it was dusk and it just wasn't working, I couldn't work out, it just didn't seem to have a drama about it, it felt quite insipid, so then I, I made it night, and then suddenly everything popped out and the whole thing made sense, and it was a much better articulation of my idea, so that's part of the process, I guess, in being in the studio, is you just have to try these things and find out what works, and it's a process of deduction sometimes. I promised <clears throat> and earlier that I wouldn't make her do any pictorial analysis on her own work. <laughs> but I do remember um, being really fascinated when you told me about the background colour of um, Trichema. What should I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, was it the red that was um, from a very specific plant that then had... Oh, yes, that's true. Um, so Trichema is related to... The title is related to female dragon. Um, from the Greek, apparently, 
But the, the dragon tree is something that grows on the island of Socotra off, off Yemen. And there are these incredible trees that have a skin-like bark. And they're papery, they're, they're amazing, they're built up with layers. But the actual, if you hacked into the tree, then it's, the sap is ruby red, it's like blood. And the actual pith inside the tree, I'm sure that's not the right word, is meaty. It's like a heart, it's almost as though it's got a heart. And this tree has got incredible healing properties. It's um, a pain reliever and uh, an antiseptic, and it's used in a lot of local uses for that a variety of different things. And it felt, in part, quite a fitting metaphor with which to start. It had an anthropo anthropological, Christ, I'm having a real problem speaking tonight, um, aspect to it. And so that was involved with titling the tree, or titling the painting. When I found the tree, I realized that I'd found the title for the painting. I think that's especially revealing of the level of research that goes into your work, and hence my, my opening question, which I might come back to you to finish off. But um, are there any more questions before we wrap up? Um, to achieve the work, it must you must have an incredible intellectual stamina to achieve that work. It doesn't, you know, it, it, um, it necessitates that, um, but it also necessitates surely um, definite boundaries within the studio. And I'm just intrigued about those. And you know, I wondered if you felt you could, you know, share that. Maybe that's asking too much, but that would be interesting. Um, yeah. Do you mean? separating out the kind of thoughts you have as part of the creative process and then thoughts I might have living life and, and domestic responsibilities and that kind of thing. Do yeah, you I suppose, yeah. yeah, just how you, yeah. you know, have the time and, um, you know, a day is quite a short thing in some ways and, um, you know, how, whether you allow yourself to read in the studio, do you make rules, you know, just rules in the studio are kind of intriguing. Yeah, um, it's a really good question, actually. I think you just have to be incredibly disciplined if you want to have any kind of life outside of the studio. And I do work incredibly hard, and there's a real pleasure in that. But I, I think it's really important in order to be relevant as an artist that you also have to live life. And otherwise, it just becomes this masturbatory exercise where you're just referencing your own experience and you're not fully understanding the, the cultural or social context with, that your work is going to be seen in. So I do have fairly strict boundaries, actually, um, although it is quite compulsive. So I do find, and I think a lot of artists can relate to this, that you never properly switch off. And so that can be very frustrating if you're in a domestic situation and you just want to think about your studio and what's going on, but I have to say that I'm in a really fortunate position having a supportive partner and enough cash at this stage to be able to pay for somebody to look after my child while I work, and I think that has, that has made all the difference in the world. And then once I get to the studio, I don't find it hard to be disciplined and to get on because it's such a relief to get to the studio and to be able to give a voice to all these other things that are going on. Thank you. Just based on what you're saying about how we need to live to be an artist and we need to be relevant in society, and I wonder whether that um, applies to the people who see your work and about the reach of your work, who actually gets to access it, because obviously we're in quite a rarefied environment, and you know, I guess a particular kind of person might see your work, um, and whether that, that feedback, that sort of wider feedback, is important. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, I, the ideal audience for me would be as disparate crowd as possible. You know, um, I like to feel that the work is accessible, and you'd be surprised who comes to this gallery. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people from all different kinds of walks of life that have seen the work, and one of the best feedback, one of the best pieces of feedback I've had for this show. I wasn't here, but there was a, a guy that came in that had a monkey and a pomegranate tattooed 
on his arm. And he wanted to talk, to, fortunately I wasn't here, but he wanted to talk to me about ideas that he had with regarding his tattoo and similar kind of signifiers in the work. And um, yes, to answer your question, I think it's really important that as many different people as possible see all art, obviously. Um, but also, it's the, the person that's standing in front of the painting that brings their experiences to the work, and that's when the work happens. I don't see the work as something that happens in the painting, but more in the mind of the person that's looking at the work, and, that, and they can be absolutely anybody. And in terms of learning from your own work and yeah. moving forward, um, this, this body of work you've spent three years, probably longer really, um, making that deep initial period of research, the incredible stamina, the period in the studio of, um, I mean, an endurance test, a real sort of perseverance and incredibly laboured practice. Um, this exhibition opened maybe six weeks ago. Yeah. Maybe you've had a week off or so. What, what now? Is there a new research journey starting? Yeah, so it's actually real relief to start the new body of work because I stopped painting about a month, for about a month actually, because I was just organising the log logistics of the show and all the rest of it. And I felt so emptied at that point that I had all this huge body of work. It was almost as though I was constipated towards the end. I couldn't, all I could think about was this exhibition and putting this exhibition up because I did do other projects during that time, but they weren't of equal importance by any stretch of the imagination. So um, it's been a real relief and a pleasure to get back to the studio and just to be faced with, well, I don't use a white starting point. I always mix a ground in. But it's a relief to be staring at nothingness and to think again completely fresh terms and the challenge of making new work and building on the things that I thought went well about this exhibition and pushing those on forward. It's, it's actually greatly exciting. It's exciting for us too. Can't wait to see what you will do next. Um, and you've been so generous and thoughtful with your words. Thank you very much. Thanks. for being here.